we are asking that God will have his way in this place today. The message that I'm going to bring to you, I'm going to sing about it and then preach about it. It's the same message. Listen to the words of the song. I pray that you will hear these words come from scripture. Stand ye gazing there up into the sky. Be not discouraged, for we have brought good news. This same Jesus. Whom we do magnify, soon he will come again for all to glorify. He is coming again. He is coming again. Son of the Father, he is coming again. On Calvary, he claimed my destiny. Lord, I humble myself to thee. Lord, I want to see your face, just help me be strong, I know you will return, I know it won't be long, he is coming again. He is coming again, Son of the Father. He is coming again. On Calvary, He claimed my destiny. Lord, I humble myself. up the trumpet and loud let it ring Jesus is coming again cheer up ye pilgrims be joyful and sing Jesus is coming again coming again coming again Jesus is coming again coming again Coming again, Jesus is coming. Again. Let us pray. Father, as we open your holy word, I ask that you would cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Fill my life with your Holy Spirit's presence and power 
Speak to me, through me, and for me. I promise you, Lord, I'll always give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let the church say, praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles with you, go with me to the book of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. The book of John, chapter 14. The Bible says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Praise God for his word. The Bible tells us that after Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, two of his despondent followers were making their way home to the town of Emmaus. They had gone to Jerusalem to witness what they thought would be the coronation and exaltation of Jesus as Messiah. Instead, they watched as Jesus was surrounded by angry crowds and paraded through the streets like a convicted felon. They saw him scourged and beaten, spat upon by drunken men. And then they saw him nailed to a cross like a thief and common criminal. And at Calvary, they watched as Jesus died an ignominious death. Those two bewildered disciples speechless with grief, tormented by discouragement, their faith shattered, their confidence crushed, began their journey home in a fog of disillusionment and disbelief. As they walked in the grim shadow of the cross, they were so absorbed in their anguish and grief, they didn't notice that a stranger had stolen up beside them. So immersed were they in their own pain, they didn't even look at his face or inquire of his identity. The stranger walked alongside them, a silent listener to their words of doubt and discouragement. Finally, with their anguish so sharp, their hearts so heavy, they could no longer contain their pent-up grief. And in the presence of this stranger, they began to weep bitter tears. The stranger interrupted them, interrupted their moaning with what appeared to them as an inexplicable inquiry. He said, what is it that has you all so sad? What is it that has you both so distraught and disturbed? The two disciples looked at the stranger in disbelief, as if to say, are you kidding? Where have you been? Haven't you heard? Our Lord Jesus was condemned and crucified by the priests and rulers. And today is the third day 
since his death on the cross. Then the stranger spoke to them saying, but did not the prophets say that it would come to pass just as it did? As those two disciples listened to the words falling from the lips of that stranger, the clouds of anguish that hung over their heads were lifted. And before they knew it, they had arrived at the door of their home in Emmaus. The stranger turned his face to depart from them, and they wouldn't let him go. Sir, they said, please, abide with us. The sun has set. You cannot travel in the dark. I thank you, said the stranger, but I really must be going. No, no, please, sir, stay with us. All right, said the stranger. He followed them into their humble home. And as they sat down at the table to break bread and he stretched out his hands to bless the food, the disciples almost fell over with shock and astonishment. They noticed the nail prints in his hands, a glow of divine power and peace was shining upon his face. And they cried out, it is Jesus. He is risen from the dead. And as they rose to cast themselves at his feet, the Bible says, he vanished. He disappeared from their midst. Now church, we know that those two disciples were not the only ones who saw Jesus after he was risen. The Bible says that Jesus walked around in his resurrected form for 40 days. Hallelujah, God. I have to control myself in the pulpit. I'm so sorry. For everybody who knows I get all excited, please forgive me. But when I think about Jesus walking around in his resurrected form. Did you know that hundreds of people in the flesh saw that Jesus had risen from the dead? Look at the book of Acts chapter 1. It said Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. And verse 3, to whom also he showed, come on, himself alive after his passion. By many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God for 40 days. After his resurrection, Jesus taught his disciples and instructed them in the way of life. And then the Bible says in Luke chapter 24, verse 50, and he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And when he blessed them, the sky above their heads filled with the glorious sight of angels who had come and were waiting in a shining cloud to escort Jesus to his heavenly home. And you know what the servant of God says? Among those angels were the two angels who had been with Jesus throughout his life. I did not know everybody got a God and angel. Jesus had two. Those were the same two angels who had come to the tomb at the resurrection of Jesus. After he said this, the Bible says he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. And this is what I sang in those words. 
men of Galilee, they said. Why do you stand here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And as those angels spoke, the words of Jesus echoed in their heads, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I... I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Brothers and sisters, those words spoken by Jesus, I call them the crown jewel of all the promises of Jesus. Hallelujah and amen. Those words are to me the crown jewel of all of the promises of Jesus. And it's why I am honored to be called an Adventist. It's about this promise. The crown jewel of all of his promises. Because in this promise, he says, I am going to prepare a place for you. He said, I am coming again. I will take you back with me. And where I am, you will be forever. What an explosive promise made by one who keeps all his promises. Hebrews 10.23 says, He who promised is faithful. The New English Bible translates it, The giver of the promise can be trusted. One day a little girl pointed to the Bible that stood on the bookshelf at her home and asked her mother, Whose book is that? Startled by her daughter's question, the mother answered, Why, honey, don't you know? It's God's book. With her eyes wide open, the little girl said, then don't you think we ought to give it back to him? No one around here reads it. <laughs> we need to read the promises of Jesus. Especially this promise. The crown jewel of all his promises. I will come again. You ought to let this promise break up your apathy. Woo! You ought to let this promise break up your discontent. I will come again. And where I am, you will be. Where I live, you too will live. Somebody said, I got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Way beyond the blue. Brothers and sisters, can you hear me today? There is no greater, more glorious promise that Jesus has made to us than this promise. I will come again. That where I am, you will be. Throughout his ministry on earth. Think about this. Jesus made many promises. He promised us eternal life. Somebody say, praise God. He promised us the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. He promised us forgiveness of sin. Hallelujah, God. He promised us righteousness and peace. He promised to set us free from the power of sin and the penalty of sin. He promised to answer our prayers. Thank you, Jesus. He promised to give us love and joy and peace. 
But hear me today. All of those promises would not have the same meaning to us without this promise. So what if you've been forgiven if he's not coming back? What's the point? So what if you're free, but he's not coming back? That's why I call it the crown jewel of the premises of Jesus. And if I were asked to choose the most cherished promise of all the promises Jesus made, this would be the one. I will come again. And where I am, you will live there throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Oh, what a promise. He's coming back. I said, what a promise. He's coming back for you and for me. It is an astounding promise, amazing promise. Come on, I can't find the superlatives. It is a stupendous promise. It is an overwhelming promise. It is a compelling, overpowering promise. <laughs> irresistible promise and in all of history no one has ever made such a promise and then backed it up with a resurrection and an ascension I will come again it carries with it the weight and promise of eternity and with a promise like this how can we not prepare for the fulfillment of this Advent promise. Now, I don't know if you know it, but even if you look tonight on the news, you'll see this country is in a mess. This world is going crazy. This country, well, I'm, I ask, can I, can I have permission to say it like I see it? This country is being overrun by lunacy, idiocy, and madness. Did you hear what I just said? This country is being overrun by lunacy, idiocy, and madness. You got smart people handcuffed by crazy people. It's supposed to be the other way around. You got smart people controlled by crazy people. Smart people ruled and dominated by crazy people. Somebody say, even so, come Lord Jesus. The Bible says, before Jesus comes again, look at what I'm about to show you. Matthew 24, verse 10. This is what Jesus said. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall what? Hate. Hate one another. That's where we are in America. And look at verse 11. And many oh, false prophets shall arise and what? That's where we are in this country. We got false prophets not only in the church, we got false prophets in the media, on the Supreme Court, deceiving people. We have false prophets in the State House, in the Congress, in the Senate, who, as the Bible says, shall rise and deceive many. That's where we are. And in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, and because what? Iniquity, that's sin, shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. A friend of mine sent me a picture of a pastor in one of our churches in the Atlanta area beaten to a pulp, black, blue. He walked into the gymnasium of his church and saw some young men who were not supposed to be there. He said, look, uh, you're not supposed to be in here. And they left. But as he walked out the door, they almost beat him to death. 
The love of many shall wax cold. That's where we are. But thank God, thank God. We got this promise. This promise from Jesus. Let not your heart be troubled. You know what that means? That means no matter how bad it gets down here, don't be overwhelmed. Don't be anxious. Don't be confused. Don't be defeated by bitterness. Don't be intimidated by the circumstances. We have a promise that we can build our eternal futures upon. Jesus is coming again. So when the winds of confusion blow like angry gales on dark waters, remember this promise. He's preparing a place for you and he's coming again. This promise right here, this promise, I hope you understand now why I call it the crown jewel of the promises of Jesus. Somebody said, though billows roll, this promise cheers us. Amen. And, and, and it keeps my soul. I go to prepare a place for you. That means, that means somewhere in the infinite realms of outer space, there is a place that God calls my home, your home, a permanent home. Hallelujah. Nobody can foreclose on that house. Help me, Jesus. Abiding in the heavens, grand dimensions, beautiful for situation, do you know, did you know, I, I, I looked it up, you know, I love researching. Did you know this earth we live on is in one galaxy called, you know what it's called? The Milky Way. One galaxy. The world we're on is in one galaxy called the Milky Way. And did you know that the Milky Way, in the Milky Way, the sun you see <laughs> is one of a hundred billion stars. Oh, you're not listening to me. The sun you see in our Milky Way is one of a hundred billion stars. And check this out. We are just one galaxy with over a hundred billion stars. But did you know how many galaxies there are? Recent estimates tell us, scientists tell us, there are as many as two trillion galaxies in the universe and you want to know if there is a God I want to tell you that there is one whose presence fills up my God my God all of those galaxies his name is Jesus. And not only does he hold infinite youth within his bosom, this same Jesus has made my arrival in his eternal home the object of his supreme concern and the object of his intense regard. He said, I got a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> you run a hundred some trillions of galaxies. You got a lot of stuff. Come on, somebody. You got a lot of stuff going on. But he said, I got a lot of stuff going on, but I'm coming for you. The same Jesus who planted his footsteps in the sea and walked upon a raging storm. He is not so absorbed in the management of the glories of his universe that he hasn't forgotten to take the time to prepare eternal lodging for you and for me. 
And somewhere I read, he is working on a welcome celebration, the likes of which we have never seen in this universe. So brothers and sisters, this same Jesus, born of a virgin, baptized in the Jordan, before he left the earth, left us this promise. I'm coming back for you. You know, the one who stilled the raging storm? I said, you know, the one who was nailed to the cross? You know, the one who conquered death and hell? He said, I'm coming back for you. For the Lord, the Bible says, the Lord himself. <laughs> he, he, what did it say? The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. He's coming back for you. And those who pierced him, Bible says, shall see him, and they too will call him blessed. blessed. I said he's coming back, somebody. Yeah. He said in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and that's where he is, we too will be. And this glorious promise, you can depend on it with absolute confidence. It is a living promise that no earthly power can take away from us. It's a promise that is imperishable. It is undefiled. It is unfading. It is backed up by the treasures of heaven. It is backed up by the character of God. Matthew 23 verse 39 says, For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And what a day it will be when Jesus comes to get us. It will look like this. It will look, the servant of God, it will be a massive white cloud shining with glory and splendor. It will be moving towards this earth with haste and deliberate speed. And the light that sparkles in the eyes of Jesus will dance and flicker like flames of burning fire. And his face shall shine brighter than the light. You can't look at the sun. You won't be able to look in his face like that. His voice will sound like a thousand orchestral symphonies playing with power and unity. And at the sound of his coming, the earth will tremble. And the Bible says every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill will be made low and the crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places plain. And upon his head will rest not a crown of thorns, but a crown of glory. Upon his robe a name is written there, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And when we see him coming, we will cry out again, Blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. What a day it's going to be when we see him coming and, he'll be, and, and guess what? Flying all around us will be saints caught up from their dusty graves. A whole bunch of people that are buried in this church will be coming up out of their graves. They're vivacious. I said their faces will be vivacious, exuberant smiles will be upon their countenances. Their smiles will be saying to the universe, we told you so. I told you he was coming for me. Behold, I show you a mystery. The Bible said we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the last blast of Gabriel's horn, we will be transformed. Thank you, Jesus transfigured, thank you Jesus, and translated and transported. To your heavenly home. And, and let me, and escorted. Brothers and sisters of Seventh-day Adventist Christians, our hearts are consumed by this promise. That's what being an Adventist means. 
that your heart is consumed by this promise that he's coming again. It's, that's why I call it the crown jewel of all his promises. We hold it precious in our hearts. He's coming again. We believe in the second advent, the second coming of Christ. And we cherish this promise that when Christ shall appear in all his glory, that we shall be like him. We will be immortal. We will be eternal. We will be everlasting, incorruptible. We shall be like him, the Bible says, and we will go with him to the Father's house where he's taken us. John said, let me tell you about where he's taken us. John said, and there came unto me one of the seven angels saying, come let us show you the bride and the, the lamb's bride. And he carried me away in the spirit. Amen. Amen. And there came unto me great and high mountain. I went up to a great and high mountain. My God. Oh Lord. Are you with me today? And showed me what? It showed me what? Showed me what? My new home. That great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto stone, most precious, clear as crystal. The city was made of pure, transparent gold that looked like glass. And in our new home, there is a river that flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And on either side of the river stands the tree of life. Church, Jesus is coming again and that's where he's taking us. Beyond the sorrows and the misery of life, beyond the pains and affliction, beyond every source of stress and distress, beyond our trials, beyond our torment, all the troubles that afflict us, he is coming to take us to a home in the heavens and I don't know about you, but I'm looking beyond the trials. I'm looking beyond the disappointments of this life. I'm looking beyond every hardship and every failure, beyond every grief, beyond every tear. And I hold in my heart this promise from Jesus. It is a promise that shines brighter in the darkness, a promise that can never be tarnished by adversity when he comes again, the Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. When he comes again, we will all stand and shout and sing. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. First John 3, 1 verse 1 through 3 says, Behold, what manner of love hath the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of and daughters of God, think of it, think of it, with all your shortcomings, with all your failures, you can still every day tell yourself, he's coming for me. With all your faults, all your weaknesses, Every day you can tell yourself, he's, come on, say it with me. He's coming for me. With all my flaws and failings, he's coming for me. Troubled on every side, but not distressed. Perplexed, but not in despair. He's, come on now, he's coming for me. This promise from heaven shines like a beacon upon life's troubled sea. He's coming for me. So excuse me. I said, excuse me. If once in a while you see me absorbed in deep meditation. I said, come on. I said, excuse me. If every now and then it looks like I've zoned out for a while. I'm just dreaming about what I'll be doing a hundred years from now. If ever 
every now and then it seems like I'm in a trance. Oh, I'm just dreaming about what I'll be doing a thousand years from now. Come on, can you dream with me? Woo, can you dream with me? We can dream this dream all because of this promise from Jesus. I will come again to receive you unto myself that where I am, you will be also. This promise from Jesus is my anchor in this crazy world of ours. And I don't know where you look for your security and your stability in this wild, unstable world. My sanity is anchored in this promise. <laughs> Hallelujah, God. He's coming again. And we have divine assurance that this one promise will be kept. Our future is secure because of this promise. Jesus says that we will inherit the kingdom and we can trust in it. We can feel secure in it. We can be satisfied with it. We can long for it. You know, the way you long for the sun to rise after a long, dark, stormy night. And we as Adventists, we don't get excited enough about this promise. We should never be ashamed in our moments of fellowship to preach about this promise, to sing about this promise to shout about this promise, to declare to the world, we believe Jesus is coming again. He said, where I am, you will be, and we believe it. We don't have to know the exact day and time he's coming back. He said, just be ready. We don't have to know the precise details about where he's taking us. You know why? I don't know about you. But I'm fine with 1 Corinthians 2, 9. I have not seen. <laughs> I don't have to know all of these. I'm good. With this, amen, with, with 1 Corinthians 2, 9, I have not seen. No, it heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. I, I know this, isn't, this, isn't, this is kind of crass, but I'm cool with that. I'm good. How about you? I'm always ready to say, wherever Jesus will be is heaven to me. Jesus, wherever you live, I'm good. I can live there too. Amen. You know, there are people who mock at our longing to be where Jesus is. They think it's a kind of morbid longing for some faraway heavenly Disney illusion. They see it as a sentimental escape from the press and pain of life. But I want you to know this morning where Jesus said he's coming to take us to is a real place. And just cause we're short on details doesn't make it any less real. So excuse me in this age of scientific fiction and foolhardy fantasy while I dream. I can still dream if all I got is the concept of a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm good. If that's the, Come on, are you with me? If that's the only detail I have, I'm good. Excuse me while I dream of gates of pearl and, and, and come on, and walls of jasper. <laughs> Somebody said 12 gates to a city where the streets are paved with gold. I, I tell people, this earth is your reality and heaven is my illusion. That's what you say. The truth is, this earth is my illusion and heaven is my reality because he said he's coming again. I think it was Will Carlton who said, for modern man, to really appreciate heaven, he would have to spend at least 15 minutes in hell. Well, I don't need to go to hell to long for heaven. I've seen enough hell on this earth to make me long for the return of Jesus. I don't have to go to hell to develop a longing for heaven. 
Somebody said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tent of wickedness. So today, I tell you, brothers and sisters, gather up the forces of your faith. Plant your feet on the solid rock of this promise. He is coming again. Don't let the enemy separate you from this promise. Don't let him cast his wicked shadow between you and your Savior. And don't you underestimate the comfort this promise will bring to your soul. Every now and then, just tell yourself, he's coming again. Don't let the dark shadows of unbelief cause you to lose sight of this promise. When Satan comes into your life with his vile shades of malice and evil, when he tries to fill your soul with misery and gloom, repeat this promise. Tell yourself he's coming again. And instead of looking inward with regret for all the stuff you've done, listen to me, church. Don't look back to all the mess you've done. Stop it. Don't look back. Look outward. Look upward in faith. Tell yourself, he's coming for me. Unless you are constantly repeating this promise. You know what Ellen White says? She said, the past will press its shadow over the present. Jesus is coming again. So the real question for us all today is this. Are you ready for Jesus to come? And, and how do you get ready for Jesus to come? Well, if you got five more minutes, I'll tell you how you get ready. You going to give me five more minutes? Maybe ten. Amen, amen. Servant of the Lord says, check this out. Will those for whom he has died do what they must do to be saved? Check this out. Will they learn from his life? Mm, 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 mm. Will they learn from his life what the lessons they should learn in regard to the character they must form in order to be prepared to unite with the loyal, holy family that shall enter through the gates into the city. So to get ready for Jesus to come, you must what? You must learn from the life of Jesus. And if you ain't reading your Bible, how are you going to learn? I said, if you're not reading your Bible, how are you going to learn? How you expect to learn? Learn from the life of Jesus, the kind of character that you, what? Must develop to what? Enter the gates of the eternal city. So those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people of God, behold your God. Check this out. The last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest what? His glory. Come on, church, you're with me today. In their own life and character. They, I'm talking about how you get ready. You listening to me? You are to reveal in your character what the grace of God has done for you. Come on. Are you, you really, are you want to, you want to be ready? Okay, check this out. It is by obeying the instructions that he has given that you are to, Lord have mercy, be, come on. Leave it up. You are to be prepared to meet. Can I start that over? It is by obeying the instructions that he has given. Keep the Sabbath holy. Ten commandment laws. It is by obeying the instruction that he's given that you are to be what? Prepared to meet him when he comes. If you will ask God to help you to overcome what is what? Unchristlike in 
come on, hey, hey, you didn't, you didn't say that with, 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 with any kind of oomph. <laughs> you will overcome what is unchristlike in your dispositions. What will happen? He will prepare you for entrance into heaven where no sin can enter those who daily give the life to Jesus and who follow on to know him will be greatly blessed. Say, Christ gave his life for me and I must give my life for him. If you give yourselves wholly to him, you will be conquerors in the warfare against sin. The Lord Jesus will be your helper, your support, your strength. If you will receive him and obey him, Oh, but I got some more. All who would perfect holiness in the fear of God must let go. Oh, Lord, Lord, Lord. There we, now we go. Hey, hey, this is where it gets rough now. All who would perfect holiness in the fear of God must learn the lessons of temperance and your children's Sabbath school, your children's lesson this morning. Self-control, the appetites and passions must be held in subject to the higher powers of the mind. This self-discipline is essential to that mental strength and spiritual insight, which will what? Enable us to understand and to practice the sacred truth of God's word. For this reason, temperance finds its place in the work of preparation for Christ's second coming. You learning, me learning temperance. Amen. Now we understand as I leave you the concept of preparation because we prepare for everything. I, I, as I was preparing the sermon, I said, you know, I'm so glad I live in Florida because all the natural disasters, I'd much rather choose a hurricane over an earthquake or over tornado, all because I can prepare for a hurricane. I can prepare, you can't prepare for earthquake. You can't prepare for a tornado, but you can prepare, like the old brothers, I saw him being interviewed on CNN. They asked him, when it, when, when it was really bad in, in the hurricane, how was it? How was it? He said, well, they told us we had to leave, so we had to evaporate. <laughs> you can prepare. Amen. We prepare for everything. We prepare for everything except the coming of Jesus. Come on, come on, come on. Before you take a trip, you make plane reservations. You make hotel reservations. You make car rental reservations. Have you made your reservation to be in the first resurrection? Help me, somebody, God. You see, when Jesus comes again, the Bible says, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then which we which are alive and remain, we shall be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the cloud, in the air, amen, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's what the Bible calls the first resurrection. You need to make your reservation to be, come on somebody. Every day you want to live like you've made that reservation. Ooh, because, check this out before I leave you. Revelation 20 verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection on such the second death 
hath no power that they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Amen. At the close of the thousand years, Christ will return to the earth. Woo! And he will be accompanied by the host of the redeemed and attended by a retinue of angels as he descends in terrific majesty. He will bid, oh Jesus, that's why you want to be in the first resurrection because, amen, you're going to come back to earth. And he will say to the wicked dead, arise. That's why you need to make your reservation for the first resurrection. Because the wicked, the second resurrection, the wicked dead will rise to receive their doom. My God. Let me move on next one before I leave. While the earth was wrapped in the fire of destruction, the righteous abode safely in the holy city. Oh, I'm moving along. And I saw, let's, let, let's next one. I saw that all the righteous dead were raised by the voice of the Son of God at the first resurrection. And all that were raised <sighs> at the second resurrection were burnt up and ceased to exist. Make your reservation. It is only the blessed and holy who will be ready for the first resurrection. For when Christ comes, he will not change the character. Make your reservation to be in the first resurrection. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I almost left this out. The Lord said, don't leave this out. I hope you can get to it. It starts with this world. Check this out. This world is a training school for the higher school. This life, a preparation for the life to come. Here, we are to be prepared for entrance into the heavenly courts. Here we are, and this is, that's why, that's why God didn't want me to leave this out, because this is how you get ready for heaven. We are to receive and believe and practice the truth until we are made ready for a home with the saints in life. What are we to do? Receive, believe, and what? Practice the truth. So that we can be ready. Will you pray with me? My God, my God, my God. What a promise. What a promise. And to think that this church has anchored its teachings on this, the crown jewel of the promises of Jesus. For this whole Bible, this whole system of belief would be nothing. Nothing were it not for this promise, I will come again to receive you unto myself that where I am ye may be also. Now I want to ask you something. If you want to be ready when Jesus comes, I want you to stand on your feet. If you want to be ready when Jesus comes, 
want you to stand on your feet. And we're going to sing this hymn. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Come on, somebody. Jesus is coming again. Let's sing together. Lift up the trumpet. Jesus. And I want you to sing it like you mean it today. Hallelujah. Like it's the crown jewel of God's promises. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Cheer up the pilgrims. Be joyful and sing. Jesus is coming again. Oh, coming again. Coming again, Jesus is coming again. Echo in hilltops, proclaim it, he plain. Oh, Jesus is coming again. Come in glory. Come in glory. today. Coming again, coming again, Jesus is coming again. He brings the word, he brings the word, tell the last one to come. Jesus is coming again. singing this song as we were singing it Spirit of God just spoke to me try to make sure that even if you don't say anything that your face shows you are harboring this amazing knowledge and a secret that the world needs to know. Let him see on your face that you are carrying this faith that Jesus is coming again. Father, we thank you for your word today. Thank you for this service today. Thank you for this anchor that you've given this church. May we, dear God, so live to be ready when Jesus comes again. We pray in your holy name. Amen. amen. And amen. Turn to the person next to you. Just whisper to him, he's coming again. He's coming again. He 
God we serve. What a God we serve. I'm leaving this place with one question in my heart. I will never forget it. Have you made your reservation for the first resurrection? I have never heard it like that. Praise God. Father, we thank you for your manservant. We ask that you will bless him that you will cover him and his family as he continues to preach your word. Father, we thank you. We receive it. We were blessed today. Thank you, Lord. We pray that we will receive and we will do that which we heard today. In your holy and righteous name, amen. You may be seated. will guard his children in his arms he carries them all day long praise him praise him tell of his excellent greatness praise him praise him ever in joyful song praise him praise him Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, for our sins, He suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation, hail Him, hail Him, Jesus, the crucified, sound His praises, 
Jesus, who bore our sorrows, love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Our blessed Redeemer, heavenly waters, thou with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown Him, crown Him, prophet and priest and king.